Take the elephant's trunk, for instance. It is peculiar because it has no bones to give it rigidity. Yet if we look below the surface, we see a very ordered structure. First, there is a thick layer of muscles running along the trunk which can bend it in any direction. Underneath are spirally wound fibers to make the trunk twist. In the center is a core of springy connective tissue around the nostrils. Radial muscles attach this to the surface. When these contract, the trunk gets longer. All these muscles are anchored in sheets of tendon. The result is a very flexible manipulator, precise and delicate when it needs to be, but capable of a wide variety of activities involving different amounts of force. The elephant's trunk is called into service for eating and drinking, grooming and mating, and it has a very sophisticated control system, which means it can be accurate even when moving heavy loads. For engineers, obtaining this degree of control over flexibility creates problems. If you consider your hand, if you hold it out in front of you, and then suddenly apply a load, your hand gives. For instance, if I want to take this book and suddenly drop it on this hand, then the hand gives. And the amount that the hand gives to the, to the load is termed the compliance of this structure. And the sort of problems it causes, well, it can be both a problem and a feature. And the sort of problems that you might encounter is if you want to control this structure accurately at a large radius while carrying a heavy load. It's very difficult to make a very large manipulator which can carry a heavy load with slender proportions without it giving in some way. Similarly, you may want to actually build a manipulator with exaggerated degrees of compliance and it then becomes very difficult to control that manipulator accurately. The elephant's trunk was the inspiration for this compliant manipulator under development at Duke University. Imitating the muscle structure of the real thing needs some ingenuity. This is a bellows, and bellows operate in such a way that when they're pressurized, they simply extend. And the amount of extension depends on the amount of internal pressure. So this behaves unlike a, a muscle that contracts this expands, but this has a similar action if one uh, considers reinforcing such a bellows along the side. If you reinforce it along the side, you can get bending out of this by when it's pressurized, the element goes around in this fashion. Because one side cannot expand and the other side does. Now, in the animal elements, one side contracts and the other side remains the same but it gives the same effect, so that's the analogy. A third element is a twisting element, and this gives wrist action. These have helical windings, and when this element is pressurized, it simply twists. Air pressure in the segments is coordinated by computer to produce the movement. The compliance, or flexibility, means that an operator is still needed to give the robot information about size, shape, weight, and where to find the object. If it is put in the wrong place, the machine will miss. Nevertheless, there are real advantages to this inelegant looking device. I think there are three advantages to these robotic limbs. The first one is that they're uh, fast acting. The lighter weight something is, the faster will move under a given set of forces. The second advantage is that they're relatively light in weight. They can carry much more than self-weight and payload. The third advantage is that these limbs are robust. They're similar to, uh, when properly reinforced, uh, automobile tires, which can withstand impact loads in the field.
Well, firstly, it would have to be redesigned uh, to be much more durable. But I'd envisage it being possible to design a wheelchair system uh, with an arm attached to it for somebody who is severely handicapped, who has very little in the way of movements, who could use voice commands to, to trigger a series of events. Um, say, for instance, you could say, um, reach for, which would set up a, uh, a series of events, glass, which would define a certain type of object. There's a microcomputer here which sends out digital information to um, pairs of solenoids which allow air in and out of silicon balloons which cause the movement. This robot copies another brilliant idea from nature. Muscles. If you want something that moves backwards and forwards, whether it's a finger or an arm or a leg, taking motors which are spinning fast and gearing them down and starting and stopping them and so on is, is very difficult. Richard Greenhill has developed robotic muscles. They work by pumping compressed air into a rubber sheath surrounded by a wire outer mesh. As the rubber sheath expands, the mesh contracts and moves the limb. So we've now got a muscle that behaves remarkably similarly to a human muscle. It contracts about the same amount, similar speed, similar power. And the thing about it is that it's very natural and easy then to connect it to a hand, to an elbow, to an arm, and you get the same movement as a human. This robot not only copies human muscles, it has two legs and is designed to walk upright. The reason for following the human design is it's a design that's been tried and tested. It's been through a hole that nature can throw at it for millions of years. It is the best design. Why should we sit down and invent something if we can just borrow from this brilliant and wonderful thing. So if we want to build a robot, what better? Of course, the problem is, can we? And that's the challenge.